Welcome to the Databricks Skill Builder Series. We're glad you're here. So, oh, as you know, hopefully you're, you're users of Databricks, you love Databricks. We are a lake house platform to accelerate um, innovation with data and AI. Uh, over 7,000 customers, over 500 partners. Every day we are launching over 10 million VMs and processing exabytes of data. Uh, the Databricks creators, um, the company was formed by some academics out of Berkeley who had just written Spark as part of a, a contest to crunch some big data. Um, and then they want, decided to open source it. Then they built a company around it. And since then, they have continued to contribute to open source, create um, offering innovations such as Delta Lake, contributing to ML flow. Uh, the company, uh, um, Redash, right, is now our DB SQL product. Bamboo Lib is built into our notebooks. Koalas is now absorbed into PySpark, and it's called PySpark Pandas. Um, very much devoted to open source and open standards. When you interact with our platform, for the most part, probably 90% of the time, you're interacting with our web UI. You, you have a URL, which is contains an identifier for workspace. You log in and you see you know, the typical workspace environment, whether it's for data science or data engineering or for SQL. Um, you see some sort of graphical user interface, you write your code and you run your code. That is how most people interact with our environment is through that web UI. That web UI then issues commands into the cloud to stand up compute that manipulates your data. Your data is in cloud storage and the compute manipulates that data and does stuff with it. What most people don't realize is that in addition to being able to log into the web UI, you have other ways to get these commands sent. And that's because we have a full um, rich array of APIs um, for you to send commands to REST endpoints to do many of these same things. And we also have CLIs, command line interfaces. So you can be on your laptop in a in a shell environment issuing commands, you can be, um, you can write Python scripts to call different REST API endpoints to, for instance, set up a cluster or start a job, um, a number of different things. And, and we're gonna go through kind of how all that works. So as I said, right now, most people interact through the web UI. Um, we have there's a lot of developer teams who still use their favorite IDE, whether it's Visual Studio Code or PyCharm, um, and they connect that um, into the environment using something called DBX. So DBX is a project out of Databricks Labs. Um, you you can just look it up and you'll find it. You'll find um, the GitHub repo for it. Um, and it helps connect that local environment um, so that your favorite IDEs can interact with Databricks. Um, we also have a rich array of connectors so that if you want to access your data that's sitting in, in your cloud storage via our SQL endpoints, you can connect with Python or Go or Node.js. We also have partner integrations. You're probably familiar with Power BI and Tableau. Um, maybe ThoughtSpot, maybe Fivetran. There's actually uh, lots and lots, even more than what's shown here, of, of partners who are able to send commands and, and manipulate data in here for you. Um, pretty easy to set up with Partner Connect. Um, and you have third-party orchestrators like Azure Data Factory or Airflow who have a way of interacting with the Databricks environment and, and, and starting jobs and that sort of thing. And then of course we have Terraform, which ultimately is the way to um, uh, write infrastructure as code and have a repeatable way to stand things up and start jobs. What many people don't realize is that many of these things are higher level abstractions built on top of our REST APIs. So um, when when some of these things need to stand up a cluster, 
in order to run run their code or like um, when Fivetran needs to stand up a cluster to ingest data from Google Ad Analytics into the lake house, it needs to send a command into your workspace to, to stand up and maybe stand up an endpoint or do something. Um, and a lot of the time they're interacting through our APIs. Well, those APIs and CLIs are available to you as well. And so let's take a look at what some of those APIs are. And this is a list of them. Um, we can find that. You can just type in, you know, Databricks REST API, and you'll see them here. Um, and, you know, let's say, let's say we look at, um, you know, one of them, like the Jobs API. Um, when you click into any of these, you'll see um, the type of things you can do. So you can create a, a new job. Um, it will show you what, what the request looks like and what the result looks like. Um, so here's a sample of a request to create a job. And it's, it's telling it the different tasks in the job. It's telling it different parameters, um, telling it what libraries to use, timeouts, and then it's going on to the next task and the next task. So this is, this is what you could do. You could also list all your jobs. That's a much simpler um, request. And it comes back with a JSON payload of all your different jobs. Um, so any one of these is offering you the ability to, to do things. There's even a DBFS API. A lot of times I get questions from, um, from customers saying, how do I download a file from my notebook to my local machine, right? Um, one of the ways to do that is with these REST APIs or with the CLIs. And because you're executing it from your local machine and you can just bring the data back if, as long as you authenticate. So um, we'll actually go through some of those examples. Um, so you have this ability to interact um, and, um, with the environment. So let's take a look at the practical of how you have to do that. <clears throat> In order to do that, you have to tell the Databricks workspace that you're talking to who you are. You have to prove that you have the rights to do that. And you do that with a personal access token. So within your Databricks environment, which I think I have one up and running here, you would um, click under your name and go to user settings and you would generate a token. So I'm just gonna generate one here and I'm gonna say it's just um, for my CLI demo and you give it a lifetime. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to generate a token that if an API or CLI um, or program offers this token, it's going to say, ah, that's Mimi Quinnell. She has X rights in this workspace. Now, when I execute the code, we're going to make sure that those are the only rights that are, are used. And so I would copy, this is the only time this code is going to be shown. So I'm going to, I would copy that into a, into a clipboard. And then I would have it available to me as an environment variable on my local machine. And I'll show you where that's done also. For right now, I'm gonna disable this, this token because obviously I'm not going to use it. Um, so, so that's how you would create that token. Once you have the token, I'll show you how to get it in the environment. The other thing to be aware of is that these are APIs and there are rate limits, right? We, we aren't, this isn't, um, Right, there might be throttling applied to you depending on what you're doing, but you can look up what those rate limits are. Um, I think we can probably just jump over there and take a quick look. So it tells you, for instance, um, API rate limits for the jobs API, you're limited to um, 100 requests per second within a workspace um, as far as the jobs get um, for, Let's see, 100 per workspace. Get output, you're limited to 20 per second. Um, and the secrets API, you're limited to, for the entire account, you're limited to 1,000 per minute. It looks like most of the other APIs don't have 
oh, they do, here, here we are, we're scrolling up. We have other, um, other limits as well, but the API limits are mostly on the jobs, not so much on the other things. Um, okay, the output is gonna come to you as you know, a big JSON object. It's often nice to see that displayed nicely. So we suggest to use JQ to parse the JSON output. And JQ is available as a PyPy library if you're doing this within a Python program. It's also available as um, you know, command line utility and you would have to install it into your environment. Like I, um, I did a brew install JQ um, for, for myself here yesterday. And then you would invoke the APIs with your, your favorite method. So you could use Python and a Python library to invoke an API. You can use curl at the command line, which is, I don't know if this is correct, but I just pronounce it as C URL, see this URL. Um, you can use Postman, which is you know a GUI tool to um, go to different endpoints, um, HTTP Pi or even PowerShell. I'm going to show you just the regular command line and how it works. Um, so I'm going to use curl. And this token that I copied, I've put it into a .netrc file. So when I issue curl, I say dash dash netrc. And it's going to look at, at um, what environment I'm trying to access. So let, let's take a look at what this command looks like. I'm going to go back here. So. Um, let me just, let me hit clear. I'm just here on my Mac. So first, what is a, what does a dot, oops, I can't see. Cat uh, dot my at RC. I don't know if you can see this. My uh, Zoom is hiding the, the terminal. Let me just shrink it a little bit. There we go. So, I am not showing you my actual NetRC because my actual NetRC doesn't have a my in front of it. I'm just showing you the syntax of it. So within the .NetRC, you have to specify three parameters. You have to specify the workspace name. So in that, the keyword is not actually workspace, it's called machine, I don't know why. And so you specify this part of the URL of your workspace. So if we look at my workspace here, um, that is this part here. Let me shrink this down right here. And so I'm copying that in as the machine name. Login is the literal word token. It's telling, um, it's telling curl how to log in. So th this isn't something you have to substitute. You're saying you're going to use a token. And then the token you're going to use is that thing you just copied into your clipboard. And here I've put, you know, in a nonsense one. If you have multiple workspaces that you use, so let's say I have access privileges in, you know, 10 workspaces, I can have 10 lines in here and I can tell it which environment to use. So now I want to use one of those APIs. Um, I'm going to use the API that says I'm going to do a get. Um, on secrets, we have, many people don't know, Databricks has a secret store so that um, if you have credentials, user, um, usernames, passwords, um, endpoints that you never want to have shown in clear text in your notebooks or in the outputs or the logs, it will always be redacted, you can store your secrets in the Databricks secret store. So I actually, um, for this particular environment, I have secrets stored for my S3 access keys, um, the access key and the secret key. I also have secrets stored for some ADLS buckets, you know, secrets stored, let's say, for a Kafka endpoint. So I have a scope that's called MimiQ S3 access. And so I'm asked, I'm, I've picked the API to say, list the secrets that are in this scope. And then I'm taking the output and I'm parsing it through JQ so that we get a pretty picture. And so it's telling me, here's the JSON. The API responded pretty immediately. These are the secrets that I have stored in this workspace in this scope. I have an AWS access key 
and I have an AWS secret key. Now it, it's not telling me the value. There is no way for me to retrieve the value from the secret store. It's only telling me the last time that it was updated. So um, similarly, I have, if I look at my ADLS access, the ADLS access is, um, there's only, <laughs> oh, I didn't type it right, did I? Where's my uh, cursor? Lost my cursor. Just execute it. Okay, hold on. There we go. I didn't type that right. ADLS. I have only one secret there because I only need um, a fixed token, which is another way of, of accessing. So this is how we would use the APIs with curl. As I said, you know, Post, Postman is a GUI that will let you do that. It'll let you specify API endpoints and payloads, and then it will format stuff for you. Um, and PowerShell also has a way to issue commands just like this. And again, the, the personal access token is stored here in this .NET RC file. Um, so that is, let's see, why won't that shift? There we go. That is the basics of the APIs. Um, any questions on that before I jump to the next one? Okay, so now we're going to talk about CLIs. So APIs are really the thing that's hitting a Databricks endpoint, but not everybody wants to write curl in all of this. Not everybody wants to write a Python script. It would be really nice if there were a higher level abstraction, like just a command line that says Databricks secrets get, um, instead of having to write all this. And that's exactly what the CLIs are. So the Databricks CLI is a way to be able to say Databricks secrets list, right? More plain language. And under the hood, it's going to format things appropriately for you. So the way to install the Databricks CLI is on your laptop, you do a pip install Databricks CLI, and then you have to do some configuration. Um, you have to tell it what token to use. You have to tell it what environments you have privileges to, um, or you, you push certain things depending on your machine into environment variables. So let's take a look at what the Databricks CLI needs. The Databricks CLI, when you first create it and try to invoke it, it's going to create a file called a .databricks config. So I'm going to show you um, a phony one of that. So the .databricks config, you're able to specify, just like in the .NET RC file, if you have access privileges into different environments, you can, and you had different lines for each of them, in .databricks config, you have different sections for each environment. So here is my Azure demo workspace. Here's that same URL. Um, and so here we call it the host name. The token is that personal token that you copied. And then the last parameter you have to issue is the jobs API version. I don't know why I set it to 2.0, um, but it's probably 2.1, that's what's current now. But I also have privileges into other environments. Um, we have a lot of Azure workspaces, we have AWS workspaces. And so I just have to collect those all in the .databricks config file. Then when I go to, um, Let's let's run my uh, my um, command line. So I've installed, I've done a pip install, um, or I, I've downloaded and installed the Databricks command line. So now when I type Databricks, actually let's let's just do that first. If I type Databricks here, um, it's going to give me all sorts of information on things we can do with this command. So I can do, um, I can reach down in and try to look at secrets. I can look at runs. I can look at repos. I can look at workspaces. And I can keep expanding this and say like Databricks secrets um, dash H. 
And it will tell me, okay, once you're in Databricks secrets, what are the different things you can do? You can create a secret scope, you can delete a secret, um, you can list your secrets, you can list your scopes, you can put permissions on your secrets, et cetera. So um, what, did, what did we say that it was? So um, let me just look at the command real quick. So I'm gonna do a Databricks secrets list I have to give it the name of my scope, which in this case, I'm going to ask it to list my S3 access scope. And I have to tell it which profile. Remember, I had like six different profiles listed there. And so I'm going to say, we'll use my Azure demo profile. And then it knows which host name to go to and it knows which token to use. So if we do this, we get this back. So this is a different kind of output um, than the one we did before. If we did the the curl, we get this complex JSON. If we just use a CLI, we get this sort of plain text. It's the same information. Whoops, this was ADLS, sorry. It's just the name of the key and the last time updated. You'll never get the, um, you'll never get the value. But um, if we go back to Databricks here, it's not just secrets. I can look at runs, I can look at repos, I can look, I can, like I can list out all the clusters or I could start a cluster. So if I say Databricks clusters dash H, um, I can create a Databricks cluster and I can give it all the parameters. Um, Databricks cluster create dash H. And it tells me, oh, it didn't tell me that. So I would have to go look up all the different options um, to put in there. Um, so it's, these are great ways to interact with your environment. Again, if you don't want to log in, if you're trying to do more stuff programmatically, um, let's jump on from here. So again, the different CLIs, cluster policies, et cetera, a lot of this is about um, starting jobs, ending jobs, inspecting the status of jobs. What you'll notice here is that we don't really have in, in the Databricks CLI, as you install it, there's not um, a SQL experience. If you looked at the APIs, there definitely was a SQL query and dashboard API, but these aren't necessarily query execution. It's more like looking at what queries do we have or what dashboards do we have or, or forming dashboards, but it's, it's not about... Oh, I could be wrong. This could be the execution API. Stephanie, do you know for sure? I don't know for sure, but I would I would think that if you wanted to execute um, SQL commands, you would want to set yeah. up a JDBC SQL warehouse, right? Well, yeah. Um, that... Let me just take a quick look here. I think this is, yeah. So it's it's managing queries and dashboards. It's not necessarily executing queries. That's that's the difference here. Um, and so similarly, um, with the CL CLIs, we don't have a lot there for queries. There is a separate CLI if you're actually trying to do query execution and you you like you want to bring up a shell and have a command line that says select star from here, see the results, and then you get another command line. Um, this is not part of the regular Databricks CLI package. This is a separate install, um, and it's not necessarily, you know, fully supported. It's more like a, a lab project and, you know, use it at your own risk. We're not, I don't think we're encouraging you to try to do queries over, over this. It's just handy if you want it. Um, so those are the CLIs. Um, so a couple of examples, things you can do um, with the CLI, we have a Databricks repo CLI, that was one of the ones we saw on the list, so you can create um, a new checkout of a repository, you can update a branch, etc. Um, there is, um, you can work with objects in the workspace, um, you know, creating directories, listing objects. You can even use, um, you can copy files 
between workspaces. So this is kind of interesting. This is something you can't actually do very well within one workspace, but outside of the workspace, you can issue a command, tell it, you know, use this profile and get, you know, one file and then use this profile and do something else. But, you know, be careful, right? So um, you also have a DBFS command um, uh, CLI available. So now this is, this is, this is how you can download DBF con DBFS contents to your local machine, Databricks file system, copy some file in DBFS to dot, right? It's gonna bring it down onto your local machine. So you have some flexibility here. This is a, also a way for you to push artifacts into your workspace. If you have local jars um, and such that you need to move up there. Um, hey, Mimi, so, real quick. yeah. There's a, a question here that I think would be best answered out loud. It says, can we programmatically run queries another way then? And 100%. So, go ahead, I'll just let you answer. Yeah, um, so when you say programmatically, um, we do have um, Python, um, hold on, let me let me just pull it up, Databricks. Um, I think it's a Databricks Connect log. See. Yeah. So, um, nope, that wasn't the right blog. Okay, hold on just a second. Let me find it. Databricks node.js Python. Well, and while Mimi is looking for that, I can just say that if you're looking to programmatically in the sense of maybe schedule queries and things like that, that can be done in workflows as well as uh, in this way as well, so. Yeah, so um, if you're trying to run queries, you're running them against a Databricks SQL endpoint and that Databricks SQL endpoint has a JDBC connection and we have um, libraries available to you so that you can do that from Python, from Go, from Node.js, from Java, there is a REST API. So one of those was um, available to you. I, I, I just must have picked the wrong one. Um, so for instance, um, the Python library is, it's just pip install Databricks SQL CLI. Oh, no, sorry. That's this, my goodness. That's the CLI. If you're trying, and, and here's an example of what that CLI would look like. That's that shell that will, will allow you to interact with um, as if you were running a workbench in a shell on your laptop. Um, the Python library, if you're trying to do it programmatically um, is, let's see, uh, PyPy Databricks uh, SQL is here. And so um, you would just do a pip install of this into your environment. And then in your Python package from Databricks import SQL, and then you specify the server name, your access token, et cetera. And then you can start writing commands to just access it that way. Um, but yes, here is, I didn't realize that they had a picture of this shell here. They actually have a video. So I would, I guess I would re recommend this blog highly, which is the connect from anywhere blog that came out um, earlier this summer. Does that answer the question? I hope so. Okay. I'll say feel All free right. to add something more in the question and answer box if you want, or uh, or you can raise your hand. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, also, you know, we looked briefly at the clusters um, CLI, creating clusters, creating jobs, um, runs, etc. Um, although, when you start talking about creating infrastructure. Um, it might be easier just to use Terraform depending on the scope of what you're doing. And Terraform, you know, is giving you this higher level abstraction 
um, of how to chain creation of infrastructure gives you a way to say infrastructure is code and manage it. And under the hood, they're calling our API. So they're, they're making sure that those calls are correct. Um, that is actually the last of the content that I had for today. I said it was going to be a, a quick one. So we are open at this point for Q and A. Um, and then just a reminder, go check this out. Um, but yeah, um, other questions? Stephanie, do we send out the deck so that people can, or we send out the recording, right? So people will see these different links and stuff. We will send out the recording. If you want to send the deck over to me um, in PDF form, I can also attach that as well. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, open for Q&A. I answered a couple questions in the Q&A box, um, but if anybody has any follow-up questions, we'd love, love to answer them. If not, then have a great weekend and we hope to see you all next week. All right, thank you. Thanks, Mimi. Yeah.